Hi everyone and welcome to another episode of From the Lighthouse. Now I am delighted this week to have my co-host Michelle back here with me in the studio. Hi Michelle. Hi Stephanie. Um, we won't um, make you jealous with tales of Michelle's exploits in Algeria. We'll just move on and be quietly resentful. Um, I also have with me um, Dr. Toby Davidson. Toby is the English Department at Macquarie University's resident Australian poetry expert, and he's the editor of the collected poems of Francis Webb. So we thought we'd get him in here to tell us a bit about Francis Webb who he is and why we should care. So hi, Toby. Hi, Stephanie. Hi, Michelle. Hi, Toby. Um, now, for our listeners out there, and we realise that there may be a few who don't know of Francis Webb, yeah. Toby, can you tell us a bit about him and why we should be interested in him and reading him? Sure, sure. Um, yeah, thanks for having this, um, yeah, bring this opportunity together to talk about uh, Francis Webb. So um, I guess the, the short version, because <laughs> talking about Webb can be can be very involved, um, is that he's a, um, firstly, he's a poetic prodigy, mm-hmm. uh, and he comes along with that new generation of uh, post-war Australian poets. Uh, uh, Judith Wright, for example, is a, is a major contemporary of his. And he influences almost everyone that reads him who is a poet. Mm-hmm. Um, so a lot of the great poets in Australia um, that are far more renowned than, than Francis Webb, um, who are the the subsequent generations, such as uh, Les Murray, Robert Adamson, uh, Jennifer Harrison, uh, David Brooks, many, many, many more. Um, yeah, he's a real poet's poet, if you like. And he's been a bit of a hidden seeker. I mean, poetry in Australia is already very secretive and very much like a secret society. Um, and this is a secret of that secret society, if you like, uh, Webb. The strange thing about him, though, is his kind of presence absence. He's from 1945, he's almost in every anthology that exists of Australian poetry. He's never not there. Mm-hmm. Um, but physically, he's often overseas. He's away. And in the 60s, when a young Robert Adamson gets to meet Francis Webb, he says, I didn't think Francis Webb was someone you could actually meet. <laughs> he has this it was almost ethereal um, side to his writing, but also to his, to his life. Um, but he's also someone that we really see poetic modernism start to come from. He's a real inheritor of Kenneth Slezer um, in the 30s. Uh, in the early 40s with his his writing um, and uh, Christopher Brennan and others uh, who were of that earlier um, generation. So he's, he sort of hops generations a little bit from the... Uh, he sort of grows up in the, in the, uh, in the, in the 30s in, the de- in Depression Sydney uh, and then is um, too young initially to go to, uh, to the war um, in World War II, but he also has poems published in the Bulletin while he's at high school. Um, he's writing mature poetry by age 16, uh, 17, which is ridiculous. Mm. And um, he's uh, someone who then uh, goes overseas, uh, f- trains to fight in, um, in Canada towards the end of the war. Um, doesn't see active service, but he's sort of in, in the middle of all that. But while he's over there, he's reading American poetry. He's reading uh, Robert Lowell. He's reading this generation that would dominate 50s, 60s, 70s uh, English language poetry and really wrest it across from the UK. So he, but then when he comes back to Australia, he's influenced by not only um, uh, the UK and Irish and European um, modernist writers and also um, others like Jeremy Manley Hopkins, but he's also starting to be influenced by the Americans, particularly that style of confessional poetry they talk about with the Americans, which the, f- the subsequent generation of Australian poets who make their name in the 70s, who are most of the big names now, um, also are affected by. So he's, he's someone who really um, sort of joins worlds. He doesn't fit into any particular world or any particular era in Australian poetry. But they're all, I always say there are two kinds of readers of Webb. Those who don't know him, um, or maybe three, those who don't know him, those who sort of read him and are very quickly put off and those who absolutely love him and will never let him go. <laughs> so I assume three. you're the third. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, got, I got in very... Well, not, not too early. I mean, the first time I read him, I thought, how have I never heard of this guy? Um, I was reading him and I, was, I felt elated and also um, really upset that I'd never been taught this guy. Um, I'd been taught, you know, Judith Wright and Gwen Harwood and all these people who were influenced by him and, and Gwen Harwood was influenced by Francis mm-hmm. Webb. Um, and but I never read this guy, and so I felt almost betrayed in a way. I was kind of like, how how, how is this? You know, how did this happen? Um, so that that set the process going towards the collected poems eventually. Well, I mean, I 
have a PhD in English literature, and mm. I've never heard of him. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I no. didn't. I didn't know about him until um, I met you. Yes, so, yes. No, yeah. he's, he's a real secret, and that's yeah. often people have this moment of discovery with him, where they're just they think that there are no great Australian modernist writers of the um, of the forties or the fifties, perhaps, or, or perhaps they say, you know, there's a delayed. Uh, modernism in Australia, which I, I think there is, even though particularly with, with the 1920s and 30s novelists, there is you, you do see this Look, coming through. I think through. there are people who would argue that yeah. modernism hasn't hit yeah. Yeah. at all. Yes. You know, so, yeah, there's so, that as well. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I guess that is how you found yourself uh, collecting um, the, a really uh, remarkable collection mm. of, of Francis, uh, Francis Webb's poetry and um, you know, and it's a collection that's been described as as, as scrupulously researched, um, as you know, sort of really the definitive collection. Um, yeah. So, can you tell us a little bit about uh, your journey in in bringing <laughs> together such a such a marvelous uh, resource? Sure, sure. Thank you. Um, yeah, it's been a long journey. It's still an ongoing journey. We still have the annual Francis Webb reading every year in uh, in Chatswood, and um, we we had various launches for this in uh, twenty eleven, um, and it's also the first time that it's, he's been available in an ebook as well. So, so for international readers particularly, they can get hold of it. But really, it, it started because firstly, not not soon after reading it, my my sense of outrage was quickly doubled to double outrage when I realised he was not only possibly Australia's greatest poet that I was holding here in my hands is a sense of oh my goodness and I had a friend of mine who's a great lover of poetry whose remark was quite telling when I showed her Francis Webb and she said I can't believe an Australian wrote this yeah. doesn't, <laughs> doesn't that tell you everything cultural cringe doesn't that yeah. tell you everything we expect that Australians can't do yeah, this yeah, we expect yeah. Australians not to blow us off the page to, mm. to write lines that dazzle and um, uh, sort of hold these great um, miraculous truths in them or that are just brilliant to read or ones that are also deliberately evasive of us as well. Mm. Gwen Harbour talked about his maddening privacy, uh, the mad privacy of his work. You almost have, you feel like you've come across a conversation between you know, um, uh, Webb himself and the phenomena of the world or, or um, you know, or war or God or, you know, any of these, you know, great massive themes of his. And you feel like you've come in halfway through almost. Mm. But at the same time, he's not writing to be experimental. He means everything he's saying. He's just writing in, in a complex manner because he's influenced by a lot of other complex poets, including T.S. Eliot, including Ezra Pound, um, yeah, including Jerry Manley Hopkins, including Yeats, um, all of these big names of um, the early 20th century he's very much mm. feels a part of, uh, as well as Browning and Shakespeare and others going back. But he's also trying to write, um, r- write in, in this larger style and influenced by classical music, this symphonic kind of writing, he's writing in this prodigious way, but also to bring in Australian themes and his life as an Australian uh, to do that. Yeah, And I, I guess that might have been one of the things that contributed to Francis Webb not reaching mm. the, 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 the sort of the, the, the level of, 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 of fame that he, he really does yes. deserve because, yes. um, you know, sort of at the same time an Australian context certainly nurtured him provided him the the the, the sort of the the, the beginnings mm. of, of becoming a poet and yeah. the, the possibility of being discovered and nurtured by other you know sort of poets mm. but at the same time the, the, the surely the degree to which um, you know that Australian identity that Australian sort of um, culture also must have detracted and, and perhaps limited uh, his ability to to, to reach mm. uh, sort of the, the, the sort of the international audiences and, and the difficulty for an Australian poet to be a, a poet without the Australian sort of um, yeah tagged on yeah and he found himself um, particularly when he first came through in the late forties and early fifties he was really championed by uh, Douglas Stewart when he, and his first collection came out when he was only twenty two years old. Uh, and there's a lot of writing about Australian explorers during this time, you know, this idea of the heroic, um, but also the, the foundations and the, and the mythical foundations of, of um, Europeanised foundations of Australia. Um, but for a lot of them, it was the centenary of, um, for example, the disappearance of Ludwig Leichhardt, um, and it was a centenary of a lot of these explorers, because a lot of them were mid-19th century. So there's this sort of recapturing of history going on, but Webb, at the same time, as soon as he starts to f- discover the heroic, 
he um, starts to also to undermine it as well, and he's not comfortable with it, and he's, all of his heroes are anti-heroes in some way. Because I was going to say, it's yeah. very particularly like art in the theatre, mm. Um, mm. which I think is a, is a fascinating uh, light yeah. with which to regard uh, sort of like art mm. exploration. Um, and, you know, sort of it gives us that doubling, doesn't it, between, yes. the, you know, sort of whatever the figure of Leichhardt was as he went forth in a desert mm. and then the way that we've reproduced it. Yes. Um, and the, that, I think, is, is one of the devastating qualities of Webb. Yeah, absolutely. And he, uh, like Patrick White, um, he, um, uh, he's very interested in what landscape does to people and being out in the land does to people and how there's, um, you can be formed by the land and the land can form you and in ways that you don't expect. But also there are... There are deeper truths to be found uh, out there. So he's, um, yeah, he's, he's writing about these explorers, but um, he does this in various ways. And um, his first collection of drum for Ben Boyd in 1948 um, has all these different voices talking about this sort of charlatan slash explorer yeah. called Ben Boyd. If you um, know your way around Eden, uh, New South Wales, there's Boyd Town and the Boyd Lighthouse and everything's mm-hmm. still there. He was a classic colonial um, swindler and swashbuckler and these kinds of things. So it has all these people talking about him after his disappearance in various ways. Um, and, and and very much taking on those uh, dramatic monologues of, of, of Browning in those kinds of ways. But what he does with Leichhardt and Theatre, which is his second collection in 52, which is... Um, you know, published a good five years before Patrick White's Voss. We don't know if Patrick White read this, but they were reading similar materials, certainly. A lot of stuff um, published at like Leichhardt's Letters and things were being published around the same time. Um, and we know that Webb was reading Patrick White for sure, but, of course, um, White's interest in, in, um, in Explorer Leichhardt um, came, came slightly later. But in Leichhardt and Theatre, there's a couple of things going on. Firstly, it's set in this theatre, and Webb's family, um, were particularly were a very musical family, and particularly his father... Um, used to play in the um, the Kookaburra Theatre. He was a pianist. He used to play in the Kookaburra Theatre in, in the centre of town. Um, and his mother was a singer. And um, a theme that comes up in Webb's life a lot is about music, but also a kind of a, a music with a feeling of disappearance attached to it because his mother died when he was two and his father um, couldn't cope and ended up in um, Callan Park Mental Hospital. Um, for uh, permanently um, when Webb was still, oh, must have been about maybe six years old or something yeah. like that. So they were put with their paternal um, uh, grandparents and uh, in North Sydney. So they grew up in North Sydney around the harbour and all that kind of stuff. But looking across the harbour, you can almost see Callum Park. And he himself actually ended up there later on in life in the same place he went wow. to as a child. So there's actually yeah. there's multiple shadows in his work. There's a shadow of his, of his mother's disappearance. Um, there's also the shadow of his father's more or less disappearance but there's also a shadow of his father's mental illness that he saw uh, and his own later illness as well but he's also very interested in in Leichhardt and theatre as it goes in it starts off in this very theatrical way there's the orchestra warming up and there's you know um, you know there's the hubbub of people and there's the you know first performances but the further you get into um, this this long sequence Leichhardt and theatre and you get more into what's happening about um, you know the search for Leichhardt after he disappears and all this kind of stuff. The theatre vanishes. The further you get into the story, the theatre vanishes, and it finally fin- finishes with this final scene on the coast um, coming out coming out of the desert. And there's no thing about all oh, the orchestra winding down or back to the audience. The audience vanishes as well. Um, so there's this. He's very interested in in types of vanishing and. Um, um, uh, but also, I guess, how that relates to life and death um, and, and the metaphysics of that. And um, he's also interested in people who've, who've been out there in, in the country itself. So, uh, yeah, people like Leichhardt, but also the, um, um, yeah. the, the Bush Ranger Morgan, for example, yeah. uh, Dan Morgan, who was known as one of the nastiest Bush Rangers, who, um, and, and Webb treats him in, you know, as a villain rather than a hero. You know? And it's, it's from the point of view of... Um, the people outside waiting to go in and get him, you know, and they're talking, they're counting down the hours, really, until they, they're going to go in and, and kill him in his final um, his final shootout. I mean, that might be yeah. a, a good time for us to play. Uh, yeah, should we bring in Morgan's Country? Yeah, 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 yeah sure. Absolutely. Sure, and he, the last line particularly of this, we have the reading of Webb doing this himself, um, and the last line, um, you know, the, the, the land looks grey, hunted and murderous. It's not the landscape painting we're used to. It's not that, you know, it's it's this landscape... Uh, we do see perhaps, in, and he also inherits a little bit from Henry Lawson, um, who he sort of grew up with, and he also knew Norman Lindsay personally, and Norman Lindsay actually illustrated his first book. Mm-hmm. Um, so he you know, has all these connections, 
Um, and uh, but he's he, he's also trying to get to something that is beyond our usual sort of heroic rah 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 version of Australia uh, that he grew up with in the 30s because he, he's around during the 150th anniversary, the sesquicentenary, 1938. He's he's 13 years old. And, but when he starts to get beyond that and understand the deeper ramifications of the, the, the early days of Australia and the, and the, the colonial period of Australia, um, then he gets into some far deeper territory as well. And I think it starts with some of these, um, these colonial anti-heroes. He's, he's not celebrating things. He's starting to turn, I guess, the lens back on ourselves and to say... He's certainly not towing the, no, the line. No, no. And I think that's... T- a really great introduction to yes. uh, yeah. our first recording that we're lucky enough to have yeah. uh, his voice. Yes, um, yes. And this was recorded a bit later in life, so he, he wrote it much when he was younger. And, he's, and one thing with Webb is you have to stop yourself often and realise he's writing in his 20s and 30s most mm. of the time. In fact, a lot of his early work like this is written in his 20s. It's mm. ridiculous. You, you shouldn't be able to pull this off at <laughs> such a young age. No. Um, but you have to realise he was a very old child, if you like. He grew up in, you know... Um, he was, uh, and also comes from a very artistic family as well. But yeah. we, the first um, poem in the collection, um, called the, um, the the Hero of the Plain, he wrote when he was somewhere between the ages of seven and ten years old. <laughs> and it doesn't read like a you know like a brilliant yeah. poem in many ways. It's nice sort of rhyming poems. The scary thing about it though is you look at the themes in that, and those are the themes of Morgan's Country. Uh-huh. Those are the themes of the John for Ben Boyd. It's about someone alone. Um, fighting a threat of some kind in the landscape and on the on the verge of life and death. And all of the things that he later writes about, particularly to do with, with landscape, are in this poem that he writes at somewhere between 7 and 10 with a bunch of other ones. And that's what's really quite, quite amazing with him as a prodigy. He kind of knows from a very young age where he wants to go and yeah. what he wants to write about. Yeah. Okay, so this is a good um, opportunity to play our first recording, which is a Francis Webb reading Morgan's Country. So we'll see you again after the poem. Morgan's country. This is Morgan's country, now steady built, stunted and grey, hunted and murderous, squeeze for the first pressure, shoot to kill. Five, a star dozing in its cold cavern. Six, first shuffle of boards in the cold house, and the sun lagging on seven. A grey wolf at his breakfast. He cannot think why he must make haste, unless because their eyes are poison at every well where he might drink, unless because their gabbling voices force the doors of his grandeur, first terror, then only hate, now terror again. Dust swarms under the doors, ashes drift on the Dead Sea's shadow of his plate. Why should he heed them? What to do but kill when his angel howls? when the sounds reverberate in the last grey pipe of his brain. At the window sill, a blowfly strums on two strings of air. Ambush and slaughter tingle against the love. At the cave, his mother is close beside his chair, her sunless throat scribbled with cobwebs, bones rattling in her throat when she speaks. And there, the toad's towering father leans like a splinter from the seamed palm of the plain. Their council of thunder arms him, a threat of rain. Seven, and the blaze fiercer than the sun. The wind struggles in the arms of the starved tree. The temple breaks on a threadbare mat of grass. Eight, even under the sun's trajectory, this country looks grey, hunted, and murderous. Thank you for bringing those in, Toby. It's it's amazing to hear him read in his own words, even if, as you say, he's much older in that recording than he is when he's actually um, writing the poem. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he's um, a bit a bit like um, a T. S. Eliot, I guess. He's someone who's from is from the radio age. I mean, he writes he writes radio plays influenced by T. S. Eliot. This is the great age of the radio play in Australian literature, um, which is a form that's sort of vanished a little bit. Um, and he also, you know, has his, you know, he has his recorded music that he plays. Um, but he also doesn't. Yeah, he has poems written about things on television and things like that. Um, but he's really, he's really a radio age guy. Mm. Um, well, it's he, appropriate for a podcast then. Yeah, that's yeah. right. He perfectly yeah. fits a he's podcast. Coming back home. Yes, yes. And you see the counting of this. I mean, you have the people outside um, Morgan here. This is Morgan Country, and he's talking about the country there is stunted, grey, haunted, and murderous. It's this gothic mm. landscape. 
Um, it's like an Australian Gothic that yeah, he's developing. Yeah, absolutely. And he's talking about yeah, you know, yeah, five, six. You know, he's actually counting down um, the and and eight. Um, you know, he's actually sort of counting almost the hours at like eight in the morning. They're going to run in and, and get him, and 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 kill him. But also talks about how he's this um, Morgan who you know, did kill women and children. He was known as a, as a really villainous bush ranger, unlike the Captain Starlights and, you know, the, the more romantic ones. Um, but he's called a grey wolf and all these kinds of things. But also he lives in the cave, his mother. He's sort of, he's, he's, he's forced to live in the landscape. And this is something that, you know, some of those colonial landscape did. And so he becomes a bit symbiotic with the relationship itself. So he's hunted grey and murderous and so is the land. Mm. Yeah, not, 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 a, not, a, not a very nationalistic poem. No, 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 no. <laughs> and he certainly wasn't. Yes. Do you think that his kind of rejection of that kind of more sort of shallow jingoism mm. version of Australian um, nationality mm. sort of accounts for the reason that he's not so popular? Because it just strikes me so bizarre that he's got this, you know, um, mm. immense influence on later poets, and he's such a, a you know accomplished poet in and of himself, and yet we seem to have this cultural blind spot about him. What it, mm. what accounts for that, in your opinion? A couple of things, yeah. It's a very complicated situation. Um, he sort of has this, these sort of spurts of fame, if you like. In the in the late forties, he's he's quite well known because he's promoted by the Bulletin. He's seen as this young prodigy. People like Douglas Stewart and Norman Lindsay want to sort of shape him into this new Australian Keats. You know, they they see him as being this young romantic who can write these beautiful, you know, sort of florid pieces. Um, but he doesn't want to be that. Um, so he. Um, uh, after being in Canada during the war, then takes himself back to Canada. And actually, every time he starts to get too famous, he runs away from it. So he actually mm-hmm. actually hated praise. And a lot of his things that he says, he's, he's incredibly self-depreciating. He refuses to talk about his own poetry as being good in any way. <laughs> um, you know, very much um, believed in humility, but he was also very much against nationalism. I mean, he really saw World War II um, as, um, you know, as this battle of nationalisms and the evils of nationalism. Mm-hmm. Um, he was very much against. And he also... Um, so I, th- I think he, he, any kind of that sort of, um, yeah, that sort of jingoism of Australia that he sort of grew up with, he realised um, once he also, because um, he came from a fairly progressive family, um, once he started to realise about the Aboriginal story in Australia and he also wrote um, poems in the early 50s, um, he actually also broke away from Angus and Robinson. Who, so Angus and Robinson and, and the Bulletin were the major publishers around this time. He actually self-published his third collection in Adelaide and then fled the country again to go to the UK. And in this third collection, he writes poems like um, The End of the Picnic and Song of the New Australian in the middle of the collection, where in The End of the Picnic, for example, he talks about the coming of um, the British to Australia as a as a blasphemy. And, as, and he talks about this... this um, Pre-colonial indigenous holiness that was that was destroyed by the coming of this blasphemy. I mean, it's, it's incredible. And the stuff. Union Jack is a moment yeah. where the red, is, you know, bleeds. Yes, yes. Know, as, as as that sort of I think uh, inaugural moment of yeah. you know flag um, placement um, mm. as, as a moment of, 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 of as a wound basically. Yeah, um, yeah. And he's and he when he was in, in the UK and writing about. Um, you know what he thought. He also has this long um, radio play that actually was recorded on the BBC um, called "Birthday" all about Hitler. But he looked at Hitler and said all this race hatred that he saw. He said, "Did this not happen in Australia?" And he's one of those generations that Judith Wright's asking the same questions. Mm-hmm. Patrick White's asking the same questions. He's part of that generation who are that vanguard who are starting to ask the questions we don't want to answer as a nation. And I think that was the sort of the end of the friendship with Norman Lindsay was that it was yeah, um, in part. Norman Lindsay's anti-Semitism. Yeah, I mean, he was um, he was incredibly racist. Yeah. yeah and, even for his era. And Webb's <laughs> uh, sort of inability to, 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 to deal with his own uh, mm. sort of uh, refusal to stand up to his friends at that time when yeah. he was first exposed to their ideas. And That's right. That inkling of that moment mm. as really, you know, sort of the, the, the start of, of war uh, yeah. greater, uh, uh, on on a greater scale. And, and I think you see that in the other poem mm. that you gave us to look at, Five Days Old. Oh, yes, yes. Where you yes, can yes, see yes, that yes. Uh, in actual fact the mm. sort of... Um, the, the, the destruction, the desolation, the the desolation, mm. the, the all of those qualities are coming from the light, the man-made light. Mm, um, mm. You know, sort of the the civilization is 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 where the harm is coming from. And yes. if there is hope. It's it's actually coming from from the dark, the beginning. Those who um, mm. are just starting out. Yes, and so you get that real sense of turning away from a civilization or a particular civilization. Well, certainly, um, and there's that real play with with the difference between our notion of light 
and you know religion and and light is goodness mm, um, mm. and he turns it into that electric light that that globe um, that you sort of end up feeling needs to be turned off yeah um, which is fabulous fabulous stuff yeah yes he um uh, Five Days Old is one of his most remarked on poems, and often often read. It's one of his uh, at, um, at the at the reading every year. It's often one of the ones people clamour to read, I suppose. Yeah. Um, and it came from a very personal experience when he was in the UK, and he spent um, uh, quite a bit of time in in, in Norfolk in the in the southeast of England, which is a very Catholic area actually. Uh, and one of the reasons of his falling out, particularly with Norman Lindsay, and I guess with Douglas Stewart a bit by. Um, by association, and these, these guys are very culturally powerful at, yeah. at the time. You got to remember this, um, you know, in terms of art, but also in terms of who could publish what. They were both quite anti-Catholic as well, but they were also um, uh, particularly, um, and well, both of them really were very anti-modernism. So they were again, they didn't like Dylan Thomas. They didn't like, um, or they had suspicions about Jared Manley Hopkins. They didn't, <laughs> they didn't like um, this. It, they didn't really like Eliot much. They thought the wasteland was just yucky, um, you know this this kind of stuff. Whereas for Webb, he loved them all, and yeah. he had to hide this. And after a while, he he couldn't. But yeah, he felt like he couldn't speak out against Lindsay in particular. But you have to remember, you know, he's going there as basic uh, up to um, Springwood and the Blue Mountains to visit Lindsay. Um, you know, with all these, you know, um, you know, all of his you know wonderfully lurid pictures everywhere and all this kind of stuff. As, as quite a conservative young guy, but also. Um, you know he's t- he's twenty two and Lindsay's sixty nine. I mean yeah, he, he's there he, in his he house. Be remonstrating himself, yeah, but he he, he he felt guilty that he, he didn't um, you know call out Lindsay's anti semitism, which was he said was really raw and, and vicious, even even for a, you know a pretty racist country at the time. And most people believe in the modest Australia policy at the time. Um, but Lindsay particularly was incredibly anti semitic in particular, um, and as well as you know also racist. racist Generally across the board against anyone. Yeah. Well, yeah, anyone. Yeah, I mean, yeah, the Chinese, Afghans, anyone. You know, Aboriginals would, would die out. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. He he he's, he had these very elitist views, which ironically would have gone quite well with uh, you know um, some of the modernists <laughs> yeah. uh, that he liked. But that's true. He, uh, <laughs> yeah, but at the same time, um, Webb felt that he because he, he didn't either leave or call out Lindsay when Lindsay said something, which we don't know exactly what it was, but easy to guess. But um, we he really blamed himself for that, uh, and he, he was like that. He was a very sensitive soul, and he really he really felt that his failure to act was actually the same failure to act as people in Europe to stand up to fascism, to stand up to things, to actually take the easier way out and say, oh, I don't want to be uncomfortable. I don't want to, you know, I don't want to mess up the proceedings. I'm in someone's house. It's very hard to call someone a racist in their own house, mm. um, and and that kind of thing. And also, this is a guy who had power over your career. Lindsay had illustrated his first books. He was he was starting to illustrate for his second book. Webb actually eventually, when he was going from Canada to England in uh, 1949, shortly after writing this final final vicious letter to Lindsay to say, I've had enough of this. And um, but, and Lindsay was saying, you know, you're writing in this very abstract, confusing way. Mm-hmm. And Webb defended himself and said, I'm writing in the only way I know how, and I mean everything I'm saying. Everything is based on a real experience. This is an experimental work. I'm not trying to be difficult. This is just... I live in a difficult world, you know. This is, is this, but he actually had some, uh, some a couple of pictures um, that Lindsay had, had drawn originals that Lindsay had sent him um, of um, yeah some of the sketches for his second collection, and Webb threw them into the sea. In um, that's on, pretty on, dramatic. Yeah, very yeah. dramatic. Very, and you know, uh, mm. like on board on the um, on the on, on the ship and somewhere in the middle of the Atlantic. Just threw through these pictures off off board, so the, these sketches of Lindsay just sunk into the sea. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think one of them remains um, that was, was was back here, but the rest the rest disappeared. And, and that, but uh, but also these guys were father figures to him, and he lost his father uh, from quite a young age, um, in terms of you know being physically close. And I think his father died in forty six. So um, after it's not it's, it's not surprising not long after this seismic break with these father figures, even though he's he's re- also reading the Americans. Two things happen. Firstly, he starts to write more religiously. He's yeah. reading the Americans, particularly reading Robert Lowell. He said, um, "I now have to openly acknowledge my religiosity and not to hold it back." Yeah. Um, he thought he really couldn't do that in Australia in the same way. And he also starts to be accepted more by the Melbourne poets like um, Fitz and Buckley, who are Catholic poets. Mm-hmm. But he also then, when he gets to um, England in 1949, um, and this is this is just after the time that he's written, but hasn't yet published *Like Art and Theatre*. He has his first major breakdown, and I think the two are certainly linked. Mm-hmm. Um, and that, and from that point on, and at this point he's what twenty five. From this point on, for the rest of his life, he's in and out of 
um, in mental hospitals in different ways. Because yeah. I, I mean, I know one of the uh, one of the things that David Brooks says, and he's mm. uh, he's an avowed sort of atheist and yeah, yeah, um, yeah. quite uh, openly, yeah. um, sort of uh, very much uh, not religious, but yeah. he actually says that Francis Webb is one of um, those poets who enthralls you whether or not you're religious oh, yeah. or whether you're not. So, I mean, how yeah. do you feel that Webb walks that line of, of, of writing really religious poetry in many mm. respects, yet without uh, sort of becoming that sort of didactic mm. or um, sort of r- repellent voice that can so often mar... Um, but, but I mean, you look at George Herbert. You look yeah, at Tennyson, yeah, where, yeah. where the, the poetry that absolutely sings, yeah. and you don't need because I'm also not religious, and, yeah. and yet I found Webb's poetry. Yeah, I think it's, I think it's a bit of a fallacy to, um, uh, that that we have that you need to be a Catholic to enjoy a Catholic poet. You need to, um, you know, and and of course, it can be applied across the board. But um, it's. Um, I, th- I think it, it's part of a poet's makeup. A poet has their personality; they have their own life, which is not your life. Um, it's often the way that they do it, and he doesn't try to be what he calls a dogmatic. Or, um, in fact, he's, he's very um, anti-dogm. You know, he, he, see, he, see, he, see, he sees yeah um, dogmatism being also, um, and, and sees also fascism as being a kind of religion, a kind of religion substitute, and also communism, which he hated. He saw as a kind of um, you know threat to Catholicism as well. Um, and he, he's, he, he's yeah. So he saw all these any kind of unquestioning ideals. Um, in some ways, he had a, he had a, a um, his religion, even though he had it from a, um, a very young age. He um, and, uh, the, and the grandparents he grew up with in North Sydney were, were, were Catholic and, and and that kind of thing. And he had nuns in the family and all this kind of thing. But he um, he had almost like that um, the Christianity of Dostoevsky, where he said, you know. Um, it's a faith that you have to constantly question. You know, you want to drill right down into it and find out what's what's there. Uh, and in doing so, you drill into other people's experiences. He also writes about St. Francis at the same time as Hitler, for example. Um, but also he's very interested in Catholics who broke the mould, Catholics who got themselves in trouble, mm-hmm. uh, Catholics who um, valued, um, you know, um, uh, who stood up to people, but also, uh, yeah, those who were poets in particular. He used to carry Jared Manley Hopkins around with him. He um, was a uh, great Catholic and Jesuit around in his coat pocket for years, as many people since have carried Webb, actually, um, often in smaller editions than this one. Um, so he's, he's someone who writes, um, you don't, and you don't see this Catholic influence overtly until about halfway through his career. You see this huge change suddenly where he's, he, he stops writing about, well, he still writes about some explorers, but even those are written about in a... Um, in a um, more about a journey of discovery or you know, those kinds of things um, in terms of the, the revelations of the self. But he also starts to write, um, yeah, about people uh, like St. Francis, about um, Catholic figures. You see this very clear thing, and you see this in, in the poem Five Days Old as well, because we have almost this um, writing about this, um, this, this, this baby, and this, this happened. He was, you know, he was in an institution, and his doctor, gave, um, I don't know if it's doctor's son or... Um, someone that they knew very well, uh, let him hold this baby. And, you know, he's someone at this stage who's been uh, diagnosed with, well, with many things, but um, with, um, with um, I think it was, well, it, it came down to paranoid schizophrenia, but in an episodic manner uh, later on in life. So very serious. And there were people who would say, you know, you don't give a baby to someone that's, that's this ill. But at the same time, the, the fact that he was he was given this baby, and if you like, you know, he, he's kind of holding this incarnated, you know, um, this child, so it becomes this, this very much this almost nativity scene in his in his hands. Yeah. Well, I think this is a good time to listen to Francis Webb reading Five Days Old. Yeah. So thank you, Toby, for bringing this in as well. Five Days Old, or Christopher John. Christmas is in the air. You are given into my hands, out of quietest, loneliest lands. My trembling is all my prayer. To blown straw is given all the fullness of heaven. The tiny, not the immense, will teach our groping eyes. So the absorbent skies bleed stars of innocence. So cloud voice in war and trouble is at last Christ in the stable. Now wonderingly engrossed in your fearless delicacies, I am launched upon sacred seas, humbly and utterly lost in the mystery of creation, bells, bells of ocean. Too pure for my tongue to praise that sober, exquisite yawn, 
For the gradual, generous dawn that annihilate maker of days. To shrive my thought with affection, I must read old tempests of action. For the snowflake and face of love, windfall and word of truth, are not close to death. O eternal truthfulness, dove, tell me what I hold, myrrh, frankincense, gold? If this is man, then the danger and fear are as lights of the inn, faint and remote as sin, out here by the manger. In the sleeping, weeping weather, we shall all kneel down together. That was very powerful. Thank you. Thank you, Toby. That uh, I think it's a nice experience to hear um, a poet in in his own words. Mm. Um, I was wondering, we were talking a little bit before the um, we started the podcast about mental illness and Francis Webb, and mm. you were... Um, saying that you were kind of not resistant to but didn't want to kind of emphasise his experience of mental illness mm. as much because you thought it had been kind of overdone. I was wondering if you would comment on that. Sure, sure. Um, yes, um, just before I do, I just want to say something quickly about yeah. Five Days Old because um, Webb is actually, he's writing often with these very complex lines and, you know, large lines and complex subject matter. But he also realises, um, especially from his mid-career, that he also has to take steps on at key times to write as simply and sweetly as possible. And we see this in the St. Francis sequence, but especially in Five Days Old, he has these short lines. Um, and you see more of this lyrical side to Webb, which is often forgotten about. We often think about this sort of discursive, mm. um, sort of symphonic Webb. He also writes lyrical pieces. But formally, you know, sex texts. Yes. You know, six yeah, verses, very formal. Yep. And yep. then this gorgeous title of Five Days Old. Mm. And so you just get this sense of the one plus. You know, yes. One more. Yeah. Afterwards. Yes. And it's just divine. Yes. I, I mean, really. Well, literally, in, in yeah, for Webb, yeah. You know, Christmas divine. is in the air, you know. And I think because so many of his poems, one of the things that I noticed was the, the way that the, the very final stay stands will devastate. Mm. You know, it just, oh, yes. It, it just, dev- there's just this yeah. moment where yes. the end yeah. is more than just the end. And yet, in this poem, mm. um, it's, it's, it's radiant. Yes. And I think that it. it Devastatingly it, radiant. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, yeah. And it's one of those. Few, it's lovely to have this as a selection because it is one of those poems mm. which really um, sings. In, in Absolutely. And uh, Les Murray called him uh, in, in his 1973 obituary, which we have on the back of the book, uh, called him a, a master of last lines, last stanzas, and final phrases. Yeah. You know, uh, and, and for Les Murray to call someone a master, and for uh, for a masterful poet to call someone a master. Um, you know, within the secret society of poetry, that that that's pretty serious. That's yeah. that's very serious. Think of it like uh, you know, um, you know, those up the ranks of kung fu or karate or something well, like I, that. You I'm know, so you call someone a master, you have to really mean it. You know, I'm a convert, and you realise that yes. you can't get this back. Oh, no, 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 I've given you a copy of the book. Yeah. I, I know I never get them back. It's, it's, That's it's, a good it's sign. coming back to you, I'm telling no, you. No, no. But he also says these things about, you know, the, um, you know, the mystery of the world. And, and Blake had the same idea and many others um, before and since. And um, Webb certainly knew his, his religious and mystical poets. Uh, about um, the line that he has here, to blown straw was given the fullness of heaven, you know, to, to a dirty manger, you know, is given the incarnation and, and you know, the incarnation of God. Well, I think of, it was also God. Judith Wright, and this yeah. is where you talk about her being influenced by yes. Webb, and I'm, I'm sure it was, it was Judith Wright who, mm. who spoke about, you know, sort of, if there's an end to the world, it's, it's when we reduce everything to materialism. Yes, and yes, they both had a materialism. Yeah, and yeah. I, I think you see that and you feel that here, mm. and it, 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 it's it's so powerful. And I, and I feel as though it's it's he's a, he's a poet for our age as much as oh, his certainly. Own. Yeah, because he's yeah. he is in many ways outside his own era. Uh, and that's one of the reasons he hasn't landed because mm. he's not he's not part of a school of poets. He's not part of a, a movement of poets. Yeah. Um, he's actually above all that in many ways. And it's an yeah, he is. He is, and that makes him you know more amazing as well. And he's also ahead of the curve in a lot of ways. If he'd stayed writing these sort of you know pro pro national you know sort of semi heroic explorer myths through his whole life. Well, you think about Asia Hope in Australia, you know. Yeah, the, the yeah. Reasons why you know you mm. find yourself in a particular canon yes and, yes yes um, and hope is writing sort of anti a lot of these things as well and, and that 50s generation of australian poets that webb is certainly part of um were, were turning against the grain as were mm. artists in the 50s as well against you know starting to look more deeply you know in, inside mm. um you see also you know he also writes um you know launched upon sacred seas humbly and utterly lost in the mystery of creation bells bells of ocean and there are people who just come back to those lines again and again but one thing about reading Webb as well is that when you hear him read aloud and I had this with, you know with with the reading 
Um, or when I hear other people read web, I, I swear I hear lines I've heard for the fir- I'm hearing for the first time, because there's so much packed into some of the poems that you certain lines flash past, or they're not emphasised in not the same possible. way. It's not cognitive. Yeah, no, it's not. It's not. Them all and editing the book, even them. even if you put on spell check, the whole thing lit up like a Christmas tree. Mm. I mean, it was it was just you know filled with all this density to it. And there's a, there's a, in in the collected there's a long notes to the poem section and all of these things where I try to you know, make it as as democratic as possible, I suppose, to have access to it. I mean, you also wonder, in in a, in a sense, if, you know, sort of, I guess, Webb coming into his own in, mm. in, in, in Australia will actually be a measure of Australia's maturity. Yeah, certainly. And, you know, certainly. sort of, in a sense, part of the reason why he hasn't managed to find his place is because we're actually not ready for what poets do. Oh, on certainly, a big scale. certainly, certainly, and also uh, ties into the mental illness question. I think we're far more mature about mental illness now than we were even twenty years ago. And um, Webb, um, he has, he has, yeah, these moments in the late forties, in the um, in the sixties and seventies when he comes back to Australia, uh, and then again in the, in the early nineties where there's a selected poems of Webb, and and also the first biography. We finally get a biography of him and find out about his life in 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 detail with a great nineteen ninety one biography by Michael Griffiths from um, Australian Catholic University, which is a fantastic um, biography. And it really fills in a lot of the gaps. And we find it because there's so much personal story built into this work. Suddenly, all these lights go off. We're like, oh, that's that, that's this, this is this. Well, well I think yeah. he writes a, a very famous, uh, well, a well-known essay um, mm. where he calls Francis, poem, uh, Francis Webb the poet of our desolation. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. And I, th- and I think it's very easy when somebody is uh, sort of well known for having a mental illness mm. to isolate that mental mm. illness and, yeah. I, and I think that our desolation mm. um, really connects Webb to a culture and to a moment in, 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 in time yes. where um, I, where the need for someone to talk about that desolation and to identify definitely, definitely. Um, those those contributing factors and, and what, mm. what do you think for Webb mm. um, because uh, you know I mean he's well known I think there's another po- moment where he, he talks about um, mental illness as a defence and yes. if, if he weren't uh, mentally ill he wouldn't be sitting having that conversation with Craig Powell who'd be smashing his knuckles against the wall yeah there's often so that what, thought what, that what, what do you think what, what, what yeah. are the sort of the factors um, that, that, that are our desolation that, that Webb was picking up on as sure. a sensitive fine tuned instrument yeah um, there's a lot of things I mean I think he um, at at a few levels, there's um, there is a kind of sense of national desolation, and you see it in a poem like "End of the Picnic," where it's a painful growing up. It's painful to realise that the country you thought was heroically founded to be founded on on the blood and murder of those, you know, that in the fifties they're starting to realise. Um, uh, firstly, that you know Aboriginal people do exist, but secondly, that they they come from a very um, complex, highly intelligent culture. Um, and it's deeply rooted and can be found in the areas around. And he writes very early on about Ball's Head um, in North Sydney, where he's from, about the, an Aboriginal shark that was carved there. So from a young age, he knows that there's something there beforehand. And it's a painful realisation to realise that the things, you know, the, that in the in the late 30s that he saw this, all the celebrations of empire and celebrations of, you know, this, this country called Australia and realising all these uh, things at the same time of the white Australia policy and of Aboriginal people being... Um, um, suppressed in, in, in these um, in, um, in missions and, and with laws that that held them without there as well citizenship, without citizenship, citizenship without yeah. the vote with the stolen generation, all the stuff was happening at the same time and he didn't know about all that in great depth but he knew that it, it had happened and, he, and, and once he knew that nothing could really shake him from that, so there's that but there's also the desolation of realising that um, fascist attitudes, um, particularly racism were possible in Australia um, that Australia wasn't just this separate cradle, you know, of of innocence away from the horrors of Europe. That it very much was possible in Australia, and that, and that every person had the capacity to be a Hitler or a Saint Francis, you know, to be the worst of the worst or the holiest of the holy or the best of the best, um, you know, or the most empathetic person or to be the least empathetic person um, you know so he, he saw this contest as being personal to every single person and every person had to be and, and that's that also and at the same time as you know in uh, you know you have existentialism in the 50s that idea of you are responsible you're responsible for you um, and um, you know even you know even though he was um, religious he didn't expect to be um, to be able to um, 
and just to be freed for the, the responsibility of, of life and just say, well, I was sinful and just, you know, wash it all away and let's start over. He really he really thought, no, this has to be thought about. You have to, um, every, and, and to be human is to be in this contest between good and evil within yourself. Um, and that's that desolation and that risk is a big part of it. But it's also in terms of what he saw in mental hospitals. He wrote about, and, and the difficulty we're talking about Webb's mm. illness is that there's a long-held... Um, you know, way back to the Romantic era um, and before that certainly, ideas, or kind of two heavy ideas about um, mental illness and, and poetry. And they're both wrong, with, with, especially as it regards Webb. One is the idea that um, if you're, you know, so-called mad, you're, um, you know, you're closer to the, po- you know, divine poetics, the heights of Parnassus, you know, you're closer mm. to, you know, you've almost gone too close to the fire, you know, you've, you've, you know, you're, you're so great that you just can't be understood, you know, you, you know, in other words, the great poets must be mad, mm. you know, um, and, and, and so there's a romantic, sort of, yeah, it's a yeah. very much a romantic idea, and that society just doesn't understand you and wants to lock you up and suppress you, and that's part of your romantic struggle, you know, you know, um, and, and to be sort of a, um, you know, uh, part of that, and of course, a lot of romantic plots pl- play into that, and and it's to a degree too, too in some cases. Um, there's also the other idea, um, which I guess is rather than the, than the ability ability myth, the disability myth, mm. where uh, if someone is mentally ill, they can't write at all, and everything they write is therefore mad, everything they write is therefore tainted. In other words, someone gets nowhere near the fire <laughs> um, because of because of illness. So he then started to write, um, and, and, and so with Webb, he certainly from. Um, his late twenties is heavily affected by um, what later he, he gets a series of diagnoses, but the, the, what latest it, it pretty much settles on a diagnosis of of paranoid schizophrenia, certainly. And you see this in his letters. You know, he's asking people to tell the Pope, you know, set me free and things like this. Um, and the idea of scale goes completely out. But he saves his his most lucid stuff for his poetry, for sure. And he said that when he was most affected by either his illness or being in institutions or receiving shock treatment, which he did, like. Um, Sylvia Plath and like almost every 1950s American poet um, you know uh, Ginsburg, Lowell everyone went inside in the, in the American system and that's the difference with Australian writing as well in American writing they can handle their writers going to you know a mental institution in Australia we still can't um, yeah. and that's a, that's a big idea but there's always been this idea of oh we look, look at Webb's work it's complex He's got a background of mental illness, therefore he must be writing in a mentally ill way, and it's just not true. Oh, you look at his life. Feel that in yeah, his po- I can't think you could point. To no, a it's there in the subject matter, feel... and it's there in the shadow of his father's illness in his early work. Um, so the it's control. there as subject matter, but yeah, the level of control. When when you realise technically what he's doing, someone not in control of themselves could not produce this, and but it does affect his subject matter. You see in his later works, such as Ward Two, which is written um, in um, in the Parramatta Psychiatric Hospital. Um, which was like a prison, um, but it was full of all these people from society, and this is all the people, including mentally ill people, including gay people, including um, old women that, that people have got no more room for, possibly with dementia, um, um, all these different people who have been carved out of society as not fitting, mm. and you know for different reasons, some who have no mental illness at all, and they're thrown together in this kind of social prison. And he's writing about this in the early 60s, and no other Australian poet I'm aware of writes in great detail about people behind these in these locked wards behind closed uh, mm. detail uh, so behind, behind closed doors so he's he's really starting to write in terms of subject matter about things no one else writes about and there's one a famous one called Harry written about um, uh, a person there with Down syndrome as well so you have all these people who don't fit into this this nice sort of cookie cutter um, very much you know white suburban 1950s mm. you know uh, safe Australia that everyone's trying to cling on to and he's showing what happens, the cost of that society. is the people you excise and the people you cut out of daily life. Um, well, they still exist, but here they are. And, and he writes about them incredibly tenderly. These are his friends and neighbours. Um, we've pretty much run out of time, so we're going to have to wrap this up. But sure. for those of, for those listeners who have been inspired um, by Francis Webb, I was wondering if you could um, let us know when your reading is, because that's coming up Certainly. very soon. Thank you. Yes. Um, so Webb, uh, yeah, there's an annual reading for Francis Webb um, held at Willoughby Library in Chatswood. It's just a short walk down from uh, Chatswood Station. Uh, train station. It's a it's a, a free event, and so it's um, it's on Saturday the twenty sixth of August this year uh, at two p.m. sharp. 
and we have various poets and, and scholars and also um, kids from the schools that he went to in Chatswood and in Lewisham uh, reading some of his works. He went to, to St Pius at Chatswood. Yeah, yeah, That's yeah. my brother's so, old school. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah he, and, and so he, he's kind of... Actually, in, the, in those schools, he's quite famous as yeah, an old boy. Yeah. Uh, and, and they actually are quite interested in the story of this, this, um, you know, this prodigy who was sort of famous but forgotten at the same time. Yeah, and, nice. and actually, often the best readings are by the young kids, <laughs> actually. Um, but there's also Francis Webb's personal book collection, which is donated by his family is on display for the event mm. and um, it's just an annual chance to, uh, to hear Webb read aloud and mm. people talk about their, the influence of Webb and sometimes hearing stuff read aloud and if, you, if you're studying him or not um, it's a way to suddenly get a sense of all the different webs. I mean there's almost a parliament of different webs <laughs> and they all have their different styles and, and, and interests and impulses and um, so it, it's, it's an annual reading if you miss it this year it'll be on next year you can find out more on the Willoughby Library website um, it's called Francis Webb Out Loud and um, you know, I invite you all to, to, to come along if you have and any you'll be any, there any and, and Michelle will be reading a poem yes, as well yes we'll so. be there and the collected poems are always available at the Macquarie Library um, oh sorry Macquarie Library the Macquarie Co-op Bookshop on, on campus because yeah. I still set him in my uh, Australian Literature <laughs> unit for the, and we hired to those who are listening from that <laughs> from that unit 205 um, okay, thank you so much, Toby, for introducing us to Francis Webb. I feel like I need to do some homework. Yes, now. we always need longer to talk about. I know, we do need longer. <laughs> we do need longer, but um, yeah, you definitely pick up a copy of the collected poems. So thank you, Toby. Thanks, Steph, and thanks, Michelle. And uh, yes, there are maybe you guys will be one of those those readers who yeah. end up down the love end of, uh, oh, yeah, of yeah. Web Street. I, 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 I think Michelle's... I think yeah. Michelle's... Yeah, yeah, yeah Stephanie has some homework to do. Yeah, it's Let's almost like a code say. for somebody's work. It's, it's a, it, it can be complex initially, but there is a code mm-hmm. to what he's doing, and when you, once you can sort of unlock that code to what he's doing and saying, all the doors fall open and all well, the treasure comes out. I look, it, I look, thank you for doing this because the world needs more of this. So well, look, if I have work, any difficulties... I'll, I will work with you to bring web <laughs> to the forefront. If I have any difficulties, your office is really not far from mine. No. So th- thanks once again. Um, this has been another episode of From the Lighthouse. We'll be back with you in two weeks. Um, once again, I'd ask you too, if you're enjoying the show, to rate and review us on iTunes as it really helps other people to find the show and send us any feedback or suggestions um, through either an iTunes review or through the website at fromthelighthouse.org. We'll see you in two weeks. Bye. Bye.